Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to the Big Idea to Bestseller podcast. Today, we got somebody who, when I started this podcast, this is one of the first people that I reached out to because she is that legit. I reached out to her and she said, come back when you've done a certain amount of episodes. And I was like, this is a person who takes her business seriously. And this is someone who's encouraging us to take this podcast seriously. So I'm very excited to announce Joanna Penn as our guest today. And Joanna Penn writes nonfiction for authors and is an award nominated. New York Times and USA Today best-selling thriller author as J.F. Penn. She's also an award-winning podcaster, creative entrepreneur, and international professional speaker. And you can find her at www.thecreativepen with two ends.com. Joanna, welcome to the show. Oh, thanks for having me, Jake. And that was a nice introduction there. <laughs> of course, of course. Well, look, if anybody's been in the nonfiction space of writing books for a while, they've seen your books. They've seen one of the hundreds. It feels like you have a hundred books, um, but they've seen one of your books at least, and they've probably read it or have learned about it. And so what I want to start kind of is this. You've had, you share your timeline on your website from starting writing to what it's looked like at every phase of the journey, starting the podcast at every phase of the journey. And what I'd love to know to just start off is why books? Why did books become the vehicle for you to grow everything that you've grown? <laughs> it's such a funny question because uh, I, I mean, basically, I'm a reader. I've always been a reader. And uh, I, after university, I have a degree in theology from uh, the University of Oxford. So I, I did theology and then I went into consulting and ended up uh, implementing accounts payable in uh, corporates um, in Europe and then Asia Pacific. And basically, I ended up super, super miserable. I was, I, I was being paid lots of money, but I was just miserable. And so I I just it was about the time when Tim Ferriss's four hour work week came out and Gary Vaynerchuk was sort of happening, Seth Godin. And I was listening. I also I love American self-help. So I was listening to like Tony Robbins and Jack Canfield. And I was like, OK, all these people say that I should think about the lifestyle I want first and then look at figuring out what to do with the rest of my life. And when I wrote, I wrote down what I really wanted and what I love most is books and reading and travel. So I was like, okay, can I have a life reading books? <laughs> Um, and traveling. And I also have always journaled a lot. I'm I'm an introvert. I love being alone, um, just being alone with a book and a notebook and some coffee. It's just a happy place. And I was like, how is it possible to make a living with books? I want to leave my job, but this seems quite daunting. So I wrote my first book, which was Career Change uh, in sort of 2006 to 2008. And that's when I learned about self-publishing. This was before the Kindle. It was sort of the early days of the iPhone and all of that. And so I think when you say books as a, a vehicle for what I've grown, essentially, I looked at becoming an author and just it just happened to be the universe aligned that it was at the beginning of the digital publishing revolution. So what had been the traditional dominated industry where it would just take forever, it would like take two years to get an agent and then, you know, maybe more time to get a book out. And also, I'm just I'm. I am an entrepreneur as well. I don't like asking permission. I was like, I don't like this idea of submission to an agent and submitting to a publisher. I'm like, no, I just want to do my thing. Uh, so that's when I discovered self-publishing. And then it suddenly made sense that books could become the basis of a business. And I know you're a speaker and probably many people listening are speakers, but I could see a model where I could speak, I could write books, I could do workshops or whatever. And so that's how I got into it. But then I also started writing fiction and that is a completely different business model uh, altogether. But I think that coming back to your original question, I love books. I read, like, I read three to five books a week across so many genres and to make a living doing like what is my my hobby and my passion is just the best thing. Okay, I love this. Real quick, if you're reading three to five books a week, where are you reading them? Are you all on, on a Kindle, on an e-reader, <laughs> or are you just having the most massive library slash garage sales every month? Well, yeah, okay, so I, I read across multiple formats. So I do, I read fiction on my Kindle mainly. 
I read nonfiction audiobook and also I buy hardbacks, I buy paperbacks. Today I had a paperback of the history of magic that came through the door. I also, you know, I also bought um, a book on Kindle. I also got one from Kindle. Un- in fact, I think I got one of your books from Kindle Unlimited just to check you out. So essentially I'm quite agnostic about the formats. I am um, I buy a lot of expensive hardbacks with pictures and things for my inspira- inspiration, obviously, all tax deductible. <laughs> um, <laughs> Absolutely. But I, I, I do we do end up going to the the recycling center quite often as I sort of go through but when I this is why and I know you you also encourage everyone to write but if we if everyone in the world wrote a book we would all make a lot more money because when you write a book you read a lot of books and you know I personally I mean I've written I think around 45 books now but it's you know the amount I've read are hundreds thousands of times more than that so I think if we we have like a self-sustaining industry of book lovers (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> yeah. And, and what's, what's also so fascinating about this and what I find is that sometimes people think books are a zero sum game. Like if I read this book, I'm not going to read someone else's, but books, unlike high ticket expenses, unlike speaking engagements, books, people are reading, you're reading three to five per week. That's so many, that's 200 books a year sometimes that you have a chance to find someone else's book. And yes, so and- I think that's really important to recognize that. Yeah. I'd love to hear what you have to say on that. Yeah. And I was going to say, I'm also the, we, all us heavy readers, they call us whale readers, which is not very nice really, but you know, whale readers, we also buy a lot of books that we never read. Yeah. So that's another thing. I mean, I, I buy a lot of books and a lot of them just sit in a pile and in a virtual pile. But the, I think the interesting thing is that like coming back to your audience, when you're writing a book, I mean, my business is around writing a lot of books. And that's a business model, one particular business model. But I think your business model and that you focus on more in your business is the book is more of a business card that will bring people in to buying higher profit margin products and services and consulting and speaking. Because I gotta be honest with people, uh, unless you love, love, love books and you love, love, love writing, it's not the easiest way to make money. Because of course the uh, profit margin on a book is very small compared to the profit margin on, let's say, an online course or other higher ticket items. So I would definitely say as much as I love, love, love my business and I don't want to do anything else, it's because I love books. And I think what um, what annoys many of us in the industry is when people say, oh, books are passive income because they are not. You have to market, you know, writing a book is one challenge, but marketing a book is a completely different challenge. And it's actually getting harder and harder and harder because there are so many books with many more coming with AI obviously AI yeah. writing tools but um yeah so for me it is the very best business for sure which is which is great because we're going to talk in this in this conversation we're really going to dig deep into that that marketing and monetizing and, and making a living which by the way you have a book on that right but I want to start with with a couple tactical like rapid fire questions which is in the nonfiction world what are you seeing today as the best length of a book now Obviously, it depends on the size of the book, but what are your thoughts on book size, book length that you find sell well, but are also utilized well for that back end growth? Well, it's interesting because the traditional publishers had a sort of length of the sort of 60 to 80,000 words, I guess, are the ones you would have got a decade ago. But I know plenty of nonfiction authors, myself included, I have a couple of shorter nonfiction books, like your author business plan is I think 25,000 words, and that definitely sells lots. So the length um, for sure can be short. So let's say 25 to 40 thousand words would probably be completely fine and take out all the filler but the main thing is that the book has to serve the audience that you're aiming it at and so the problem you can write a short book or a long book but if it's not aimed at an audience and it doesn't serve the audience then it doesn't matter how long it is because they'll be like well regardless this isn't worth very much but the the other thing to think about is if you do write very long book um then you've written a really long book what what might be better is to write several shorter books that that hit different types um of problems that that target audience have that then makes it easier to do things like audiobooks translation licensing marketing um series which is a sort of basic of marketing and that kind of thing so i definitely would suggest for non-fiction authors that multiple books of a shorter length are Mm. better than your one magnum opus 
Yeah, no, and I'll, I'll even add one more thing on that from just like a, a print cost, right? If you're going to buy books, if one book's 150 pages versus one book's 250 pages, it's going to cost you less to be able to get more of the smaller books, which can help with distribution and other things when you're giving them away or selling them at speaking engagements, because the book price is going to be fairly similar across the board for the most part. So I, I love what you're saying on that. And I want to kind of talk about this is once people get the book done, right? which is an incredible accomplishment within itself. What I often see is that authors will put all their energy towards one launch. They'll put every energy they have into making this the successful launch, the best selling launch, which is amazing. You only launch a book once or in some people's cases, multiple times, right? But for most people, they launch that book once, they get so excited, they go super gung ho on the launch. Within a week, two weeks, maybe three, four if they're lucky, then the dip starts to happen. The initial momentum starts to die down. And a lot of people have a massive drop at that point. What do you recommend as the best launch strategy plus continuous relevant strategy? Uh, well, I don't really have a launch strategy because I don't launch in the traditional way. To me, the launch is a traditional publishing model because the books would be in a bookstore and then they're gone in three weeks time. So the traditional publishing industry has a certain, I mean, if you're talking, uh, we're talking about independent publishing here, yeah. as, you know. So for me, I pretty much, when I put, put a book out, that's how I would do it. Okay, here's a new book. Um, uh, I would normally have some kind of pre-order, but not very, only a couple of weeks. And then uh, the book goes out. I announce it on my podcast. I email my list. I put, put it up on Twitter or whatever. And for me, the business model is sales every month for a long time this the spike model the straight up and the straight down again it's a traditional market publishing model so in terms of uh, although i can say that i have just done a launch situation because i did a kickstarter for a memoir which is an entirely different matter so the kickstarter was only only ran for two weeks so in that case i did do like a, a kind of launch period but then uh, the, i'm now putting the book it's called pilgrimage i'm now putting that on all the stores so now my evergreen marketing will will continue so in terms of the evergreen marketing uh at paid advertising can just bring in consistent funnel seo content marketing i have a podcast you have a podcast um you know youtube you know you've got your constant in, in your social media bios you can use like a link tree now which has got all your stuff in but essentially you have to be feeding feeding the beast essentially um but for non-fiction authors your book title plus ads and a targeted market can just bring it in if you spend a certain amount on ads and you've optimized your funnel then it just kind of runs um so that's kind of what works for me mainly i'm moving into shopify and facebook ads as opposed to amazon or as well as amazon but focusing more on shopify because the profit margin is higher but essentially you have to decide about whether you want some, you know, sort of very, very brief uh, launch hype or you want a long term business. Um, you can do both. But as you say, you could burn yourself out doing that kind of hypey thing. I had uh, an author, Dory Clark, who's fantastic. She wrote The I Long Game. Dory. You know, Dory. Yeah. So she was on my podcast um, at the end of last year about The Long Game. And she said something that was kind of shocking to my audience who write a lot of books. She said, I'm I'm going to market this book for the next five years. So one of her strategies is essentially, you know, getting on, say, three podcast interviews a week, just ongoing, you know. And in fact, part of me coming on your show is a kind of ongoing book marketing. I don't know who's listening. They, Someone might buy my book this week, next week, next month, next year, because this is evergreen content marketing for Joanna Penn. So essentially people will, some people will click through. So that's the kind of way I think about it. Now, just to be clear, you mentioned my hitting the lists and getting my, getting my letters as we talk about. Uh, I did that with fiction, but my USA Today bestseller was five years after the launch of my book 
So it was a like a relaunch, as you say. It's much easier to do book marketing on a book with loads of reviews that has social proof, and that takes time. So what I would say to people is you really need to consider vanity metrics, as we call them, versus actual money in your bank account, actual conversions uh, to your business, to your consulting package, your course, whatever you're selling. And that, to me, is what I build my business on. I build it on the month by month by month income as a opposed to the spike and drop model. Now, again, there's va there's valid options for both of those, depending on what you want to achieve. And I played those games, did those games, and now I, I just um, do the evergreen marketing. So you can definitely do both, but you do need a long-term marketing plan. Yeah, what, 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 I'm, what I really enjoy that you're saying is you've tried almost everything over over the last decade and a half since that first book in 2006 2008 that that range when you started you've tried everything and it's cool to see how things have evolved as well with what's available the speed at which we can publish things the different changes and trends between self and traditional publishing but you mentioned a few things here that i want to i want to dive deeper into which was you talked about ads you talked about running ads to your book now for people that are just releasing their book, they haven't had much experience with ads, they've only heard horror stories of people on Facebook ads, what platform do you recommend running ads on? Are you referencing Facebook ads, Amazon ads? Do you have a recommended budget per day? What's kind of worked for you um, that you can share with, with our listeners? Well, this is such a huge topic because there are so many different ways to do this. Uh, and again, it will depend on what format you want to advertise. But let's say you want to advertise just your Amazon Kindle book, then Amazon advertising is is the one to use, uh, especially like you with a book in Kindle Unlimited. Um, using Amazon ads with Kindle Unlimited is a proven business model. However, it will you again everything has to be optimized, your cover, your sales description, the book has to be great. Obviously, you do need reviews on it um, first. So get your email list, you know, get some reviews on it, then then set up ads. You can do auto ads, which in fact is quite good if you have a small niche. So my book Pilgrimage, for example, sits in solo travel, which is a very small niche, but I can just hyper target solo travel. So people browsing in there will get my ads and everyone's seen them on Amazon. You know, you look on a book and it says it's got a carousel beneath it. So you can do it on categories. You can do it on keywords. You know, I, uh, you can target other people's books. So you could target with your book, uh, you could target my book, How to Write Nonfiction. You could target Joanna Penn. Lots of people do. It actually costs me quite a bit of money to advertise against my own name. <laughs> which is very annoying. But um, so there's lots of different ways to do it. But if you are just starting out, um, yeah, I mean, the thing is, the reality is with this as well, is that because the profit margin is so low, you really do need to have your business model sorted out. So if you have one book that you've priced at 9.99 US, um, then you know you you can afford to pay some money for clicks but if you're in let's say you're in strategic leadership or something like that you're just not going to outcompete the the big guns i mean i don't even advertise my thrillers anymore because it's too expensive to advertise thrillers so that's when you can but i am going to advertise i do advertise my nonfiction for authors and i do i am going to advertise pilgrimage because it's a different kind of niche so it depends on the book depends on the niche have a look at that but there's plenty of help on amazon you know how to do amazon ads then with facebook um Again, it really works for some people, doesn't work for other people. Uh, but I would say that paid advertising is a very, very powerful lever that a lot of people screw up because they don't spend the time understanding their target market, <laughs> the business around their book. They're just like, oh, oh, I just wanted to sell, throw money. But that's that's not how business works regardless right. of whether it's a book or or anything else so but then there are a whole loads of other things so for example we again we have a podcast and I've looked at audiobook advertising on Spotify uh, which I haven't done yet but I'm looking at it because Spotify now do audiobooks I have a podcast I have audiobooks narrated in my voice how could I use Spotify to do ads for audio so I think you have to think outside the box in terms of your don't just do what everyone else is doing. Think about different ways of doing it. And, and speaking of different ways, you're exploring all types of different ways. 
What do you see as a, we're in the new year, what do you see as something that not a lot of people are doing, but you could see it becoming a marketing technique uh, of the future, a marketing strategy of the future? Well, it is, it is March. <laughs> it's not quite the new year. <laughs> it's still Q1. It counts. It is Q1. But um, I mean, what I'm very excited about is the generative AI stuff I mentioned. I mean, I'm using Midjourney for social media. I'm using ChatGPT for ad copy, actually. It was great for ad copy. Uh, you just put in the... Um, your book synopsis or your book description and say, write me 10 Facebook ads, um, you know, for this book of this many characters. Um, or you could say, you know, put it in and say, who am I target market? And, you know, use chat GPT to sort of do marketing research. Obviously um, Jasper is doing a lot of that stuff. Um, but the most important thing, like your nonfiction book is putting your own spin on it. So uh, I use mid journey as again, as a speaker, I now use mid journey instead of stock photos. So all my images are custom generated um, for my online courses as well for my, um, I'm starting to use it for my, uh, some of my book covers, um, when we don't have time to get into the legal aspects of AI generation, but there's a lot that we'll be able to do with AI tools that is going to help us um, make better images. I mean, for example, uh, I was looking for a picture of a female combat photographer. There were no pictures of female combat photographers because it's kind of an unusual thing. Or I wanted... Um, mermaids of color finding mermaids of color or like an old mermaid this is for fiction it is you can't do it on stock photos so now generative art can really help us in terms of making social media graphics and, and all of this kind of thing and yeah I think that what I would say a, a warning for non-fiction authors is don't just generate text with the with the AI and just paste it in and publish it that is happening um, but I just recently did an episode on the tsunami of crap which is uh, basically there are just going to be millions more books to compete with but most of them will be crap so just make sure yours isn't <laughs> yeah. Yeah. and you know have your voice and your spin but use the AI tools to help you achieve your creative and business goals yeah I it's interesting because you know there's for a lot of people, writing a book is is the first step here, right? And then there's the marketing side. And now the world is opening up to AI. It's at the point now where it can be utilized in a variety of ways that's accessible to the to the public. And I think that that's going to be very interesting. And I and I love your your you're talking about the tsunami of crap um, because I think that that's going to happen, right? And we're already seeing that. But I think what's really interesting when you use AI is the ability for AI to generate the result you want. Is, deter is determined by the questions you're willing to be able to ask it. And yes. so for you, when it comes to marketing your book, it's sometimes about what is the questions that I actually have to ask to get the results that I want, right? Because as we talked about, everyone's got their own results. Everyone's got a different thing that they're striving to achieve. For some people, it's how do I make monthly book sales? For some people, it's how do I take this, turn it into leads using ads, right? And so what are some of the questions or thoughts people should be thinking about or asking themselves when they're getting ready to market their book? Oh, I turn it around completely. It's not about those questions. The questions should be about your audience. And in fact, you should have already asked those questions and answered them in your nonfiction book. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, what are the problems your target market has? What are their questions? What are their challenges? What are their fears? What are the benefits to your readers? What, what is the transformation? What is the promise that you have? And all of those, it's em emotional topics are going to help help you market. So instead of, so the question is, you know, my, or, uh, I mean, again, it's difficult to pick a little a target niche, um, but you know, my, if you, you want to learn more about your target audience and then design marketing for them, but this is where, uh, I mean, I kind of early on, I only write books for authors because I became an author. I wrote a nonfiction book about career change and then realized that I didn't know anything about publishing. So I started learning, started writing books. Then I started, you know, writing about biz the business of publishing. So I only, I write the books to kind of figure out what I think. I wrote a book on mindset because I was so confused and everything was hard. Um, so I, and then what's happened with my career is essentially I've written the books for the problems I have and I have attracted 
an audience based on the problems I'm solving for myself. And yeah. I think a lot a lot of the time nonfiction authors are writing from the, the perspective of these are the challenges I have and I want to help other people. So, you know, ask more about, OK, my audience have a problem with X. So how can how can I help these people or what questions are these people asking? And then that will drive your content marketing. You can make, you know, short videos and put them on TikTok or, you know, the strategy of how you do stuff is not as important as who the audience is and how you serve them. And when you when you write the books, right, because you're talking you wrote the books for the problems that you had that you learned mm -hmm. about and then were very knowledgeable about it. At what point did you feel you were expert? I'll put that in quotes here, expert enough to write the book on that topic, right? Because a lot of people think they have to have way more knowledge than they do. And then other people just write the book, but they're just regurgitating other people's stuff. And that's that's not legitimate. So when did you feel how much work goes into a book or how much research for you and experience goes until you feel confident enough to write the book on that particular topic? It definitely varies. So, for example, how to write a novel I wrote last year um, in 2022, and I started writing novels in 2009. So I realistically that whole time I was like I can't write a book on this I can't write a book on this I just I don't know enough and I still feel I don't know enough because um, writing novels is a very different uh, career but um how to write non-fiction I think I written I'd written about seven books by then um but the other thing is, I mean, I wrote my first edition of how to market a book when I learned enough that I had enough to write a book, but it's on its third edition. And over time, I've just kind of put out new editions. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I think you're right. You don't. For, I have a degree in theology. And the reason I mention it is because I don't have a degree in publishing, writing, marketing, Internet business, all the stuff. So I don't have any official qualifications. So you don't need a degree. But what you do need, as you said, you need to do your research and you need to have a specific personal angle. So all my nonfiction books contain my experience. I don't think. I mean, I know people do, but I mean, I think your audience too, you want to write books that relate to your experience, growing and changing and learning. And again, it's about serving an audience, the people who are trying to, who write the tsunami of crap and write the generic nonfiction books. I don't believe they're coming from a serve, trying to serve their audience perspective. And so that's what we have to come back to. How can we write the best book? And look, readers are not stupid. You know, i I can pick up one of those books and I can tell you within seconds whether or not I'm interested. Of course, my idea of what is good is different to someone else's, but readers aren't stupid. So if you write from the heart and you do your research and I mean, obviously, you have to be careful with things like if it's medical or financial or legal. But most of us are just writing more self-help stuff where that's not an issue. Um, yeah, I think you should have enough experience and enough research to make it the best book you possibly can. But no, don't spend 20 years and five degrees. <laughs> Preach. No, I'm just getting fired up over here, Joanna. Like that's, <laughs> that's what I'm talking about. Like you're, you're bringing it. And, and I know it's dinner time for you here soon. So we're <laughs> going to, we're going to wrap up and get this going. Okay. Final few questions here. And I kind of want you to answer first thing that kind of comes to mind. And, and the, and the first one here is, you mentioned that you love, you know, some of the OGs in the self-help space that started talking about things before everyone else started talking about what they talked about, right? Tim Ferriss, Seth Godin, Tony Robbins, Jack Canfield. And I'd love to know what was the number one thing, if you look back on it, that inspired you to go for it? Well, Jack Canfield, the success principles, uh, I think principle two is take 100 percent responsibility for your life um and that i read that and at the time i was like oh woe is me i have golden handcuffs they pay me loads of money to implement accounts payable and i'm like how did i end up here and then i read that and it was like okay take 100 percent responsibility for your life how can i change my direction and so yeah the success principles jack canfield really recommend that book okay great What's your favorite nonfiction book that you've written? <laughs> well, you know, right now it's my book, Pilgrimage. <laughs> 
Did you guys get the hint? You should get the book Pilgrimage. <laughs> well, no, no that's it, amazing. That's it's amazing. It's really, it's funny. I mean, it's very specific. It's about um, solo walking pilgrimages uh, and a totally different book than I've ever written. I've never written a memoir. It's very personal. It's very midlife, you know, women, women of a certain age, um, solo walking when you just don't know what to do with your life. Uh, so in terms of books though when you write as many books as I do it's pretty much always the next book is the most interesting book <laughs> so yeah. I do have I do my next um probably my next non-fiction or the next one after the next one will be about writing from the shadow so writing from your dark side and this is a book I've been trying to write for many many years and I'm now committed to it it's a very difficult book um but I that's the one I'm going to write and a lot of people are like ooh that sounds interesting <laughs> yeah def definitely like whoa how you doing <laughs> okay when you look at books when you look at books what is one prediction that you have for the um for the book publishing industry in the next three to five years that it's we we have a dark side of publishing all the again shadow side of publishing which is all the sales that nobody sees so no one sees my sales on shopify no one sees my kickstarter sales but the trend is for authors and small publishers to just sell direct and skip bookstores skip amazon skip all of this stuff and just make money direct and we can make 95 percent profit like revenue not profit revenue and um this was in the in the author space kind of kicked off last year by Brandon Sanderson. I don't know if you heard this. Brandon Sanderson made forty two million dollars on a book Kickstarter and basically broke publishing. Everyone was like, what just happened? I mean, people were making tens of thousands, say six figure or, you know, publishing. And then Brandon came along and everyone went, holy shit this is the way to run a business. <laughs> so now everyone's like, right, let's do Kickstarter. And then also the trend is Shopify. So selling direct, um, again, just with independent printers, it, proper e-commerce, which I feel we haven't had with books really yet. I mean, some people are doing it again in the speaker niche. That's not necessarily new, but for authors like myself, you know, there was traditional publishing and then there was kind of the Amazon focused publishing. And now what we're moving into is this new wave of direct sales, Kickstarter, Shopify, WooCommerce, all of that kind of thing. So it, that that to me is the next decade. That's the shift of the next decade. Amazing, amazing. I mean, it's it's so clear how knowledgeable you are of this industry, how in tune with it you are, and how excited you are about this stuff. Like, I, I love that. It, it's so it's so awesome to see that, you know, for someone who's been doing it for so long, you still have that same passion, that same excitement um, that I predict you probably had a, a, several years ago. And so that's really cool. And I'm grateful that, that you've shared it with our audience. And so as we wrap up, what is the best way to support you, to buy your books, to learn from you, to listen to the podcast? Give us all the goods. Obviously, we'll link <laughs> most of it down, but give us some of the goods. Yeah, sure. So since this is a podcast, come on over to The Creative Pen Podcast, and that's pen with a double N. There's also a YouTube um, as well. And uh, I'm on still on Twitter at, J, at The Creative Pen with a double N. Those are probably the best places. And yeah, my books are on all the various stores or my store is creativepenbooks.com. Amazing, amazing. And I have my Kindle that just says boom, 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 boom <laughs> after, after you because you have a very cool way of doing with a lot of your nonfiction books. There's a very, there's a theme. There's a way that people will know that it's your book, right? If you see a cover, you're like, oh, doesn't she have another one like that? And that's, that's just another great thing that you've done with, with your books. And I'm sure I could talk to you over and over and over again about so many other things, but this has been so amazing. I thank you for coming on the show. It's been a blast. And for everybody that's been listening to this, go buy her books like just that's the call to action today just stop what you're doing and go buy one of her books and see how much knowledge you can consume because you won't regret it so thank you so much for coming on the show today joanne i appreciate it thanks for having me jake cool